people who don't bother coming, they're going to be lost. Not that they're already not lost already. So, we have, in any commercial relationship, you have two sides. A customer and a consumer. We erroneously think that the customer of media products is us. And the producer is the person who makes that media product. But actually, business of media dictates that the product is us, and the customer is the advertiser. That's how it works. And that's how it's been since the start of the 20th century. We see changes. As those of you who have started the assignment already and have started working on it will know, there have been radical changes since the advent of digital media in the 1990s. This is the whole point of William's chapter, in effect. But the way media studies worked in the 20th century now does not cover how media studies or the media works in the 21st century. So we have a mismatch between media studies over here, the thing that should be studying and understanding the media, and actually how the media works. And all these theories of how the media works that were developed in the 20th century gave media studies what we call disciplinary legitimacy actually don't work anymore because media has undergone a fundamental change. And one of the most fundamental changes that we have is this one. We are in a system where we sell ourselves and consume ourselves in a continual feedback loop. You know, you're looking at me at the moment thinking, what the hell are you talking about? My job today is to tell and explain to you what this actually means. So don't worry at the moment. By 11 o'clock, you'll know. That's the beauty of this system. There is an extended version of these slides on Canvas. So I'm using the edited version for the lecture. There's an extended version of this available to you if you want more. <coughs> the background to this, as we saw at the end of last week's lecture, the Northwick Revolution led to the development of what we call the audience commodity. The political economy of media meant that media owners became very rich, very powerful, and the basis of their wealth and power was the idea that they could create a commodity, us, and sell it to other people, advertisers in their media products. This has changed in the digital era. Instead of ideological control, we now look at behavioral control. The purpose of power in the 20th century for press barons, media owners, etc., as we saw in Marx's model, was to control the ideological constructs in society. If you control the base of the economic base of society, the means of production in society, you control the ideologies which are circulated in culture. That remains important to understand. But it has been superseded by something of far more importance behavioral control. <coughs> Media ownership of the 21st century is not just about controlling what you think, it is about controlling what you do and how you do it and who you do it with and where you do it. It's a lot more scary because now, instead of being told what to think, we're actually told what to drink, what to eat. We're not told it, we're pushed to it. The whole fundamental basis of media in the 21st century is not about hitting you over the hammer, over the head with a hammer, telling you, think this, think <coughs> this, think this. It is about subtly and continually and over and over and over again nudging you towards a certain set of decisions that you don't even know about. This is fun. Don't ever use the word brainwashing. Because a brainwashing doesn't <coughs> really cover what this does. Brainwashing is a really stupid term. In the 20th century, it describes something that isn't very well understood. Instead, we are in the era of the nudge. Continually being pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed into a particular course of action. So when you ask yourself, 
why is the third video on my For You page always selling you this product? Well, ask yourself the money for it. How many people have used the hashtag TikTok made me buy it? On three minutes. Oh, it's terrible. Kiss your mothers with that one. Liars! You've all done it. Um, TikTok makes me buy things all the time. I'm proud to say. I am the proud owner of one of these like nail clippers that collects the nail in them. Yeah. It's the 21st century. Okay. Behavioral consumer control happens through continual deep analysis of user labor on platforms. Remember I talked last week about the idea that um, in the Marxist analysis we have labor which is sold for wages, but in our use of the media, our labor is essentially free. We are a free source of labor for the media. We consume media products, they're able to sell us on the basis of our consumption. So basically they're making a profit out of our labor, which we won't get paid for. That system has become wrapped up to the extreme of the digital age. Everything we do using a digital device is a form <coughs> of user labor. Everything. Because everything we do with a digital device provides a piece of data, which is collected and added <coughs> to all the other data that we provide <coughs> to that platform or service. Every platform we use has a vast wealth of data about us. This is the point from the lecture when somebody says, yeah, but I have a Facebook account and I never go on. It doesn't matter. Because Facebook, as a company, Meta as they know now, knows exactly what you do. All the time. Because you know them terms and conditions that you don't read? You gave permission to Meta to analyze your phone for things like location data, so it knows where you've been at all times. Call data. So if you've ever made a phone call on your phone, Meta has the details of who you called, when you called, how long the call was for. It's unclear to us, but it's probable that they collected data about what you say in that call. It has data about what other apps you've used and how long you've used them, because it's in commercial relationships with all those other app providers. It knows exactly what you do when you use Chrome as a web browser because it has cookies built into the Chrome operating system and to the Chrome browser, which collects all that information. And even if you don't have a Meta account, you don't use Instagram, you don't use WhatsApp, you don't use Facebook, guess what? They have an account about you. <coughs> Doesn't matter. Because they can still identify you via the individual identification number of your device, what we call a Mac address. Anyone who doesn't have an account with them, <coughs> they all the MAC addresses. And everything we do gets harvested, processed, and analyzed for the purpose of making us do things. Not just selling us things, which is very useful for. And that's a major part of what happens. But also making you do things. And that is the very important difference. What we have in the digital age is not just control in terms of ideologies, but control in terms of behavior also. So, <clears throat> hardly need to state that we live in an advanced digital environment. Now, I want you all to promise me something. So, please, could you place your right hand across your heart on the left part of your chest, please? So we're going to do a solemn oath. At this point, I want you all to do it. I'm going to scout the thing instead. <laughs> okay, so repeat after me. I, I, so far I'm impressed so far, people. I will, so you have the command thing here going on, right? You're going to do something. I will murder, murder. anyone. anyone. In the Department of Media and Communications at Swansea University, 
that uses the phrase new media. We have that recorded. We've all made the oath. If any of your lecturers or fellow students ever uses the phrase new media, you have now sworn to me in a solemn, unbreakable bond that you are going to murder them. I'm proud of you. Step in the right direction. You might think, why, Lincoln, why are you offended so much by the term new media? And I will tell you this. Imagine I'm going to buy a car. Yeah? I want to buy a new car because, I don't know, somehow I've got money. I don't know how the fuck this is going to work, this analogy, but imagine that I have money. Right? So I'm going to buy a new car. I go to the you know, garbage, the sales place, whatever it's called, and um, say, you, oh, I want a new car. So I, I've got just the thing for you, sir. And he shows me a 55-year-old vehicle. So that's a new car. I'm going to pummel him to death with my bare fists for the audacity of trying to rip me off. The concept of new media is so ridiculous that it is untrue. <coughs> What people, when people use the phrase new media, they're talking about things which have been around for 50 years. This isn't new. And there is no media that isn't digital. It doesn't exist. It hasn't existed for decades. Nothing out there is not digital. People will say, ah, oh, newspapers, they're made of paper. Yeah, I know that. How are they made? Everything in newspaper production is digital. They're printed digital. They are created digitally, they are typeset digitally, all the stories are submitted digitally. Everything about the production of a newspaper is digital. There are more people reading the digital version than the paper version. That has been the case for more than a decade. It is all digital. Film! <coughs> Some directors still make films using film. Well, what we do for those guys? You know how it's distributed? On a USB stick. Nobody is carting around reels of film anymore. Nobody has done that for decades. Because reels of film are really flammable. And it's a real hazard for people to actually do that. So much better off if you actually send it digitally. All media is digital. So when we hear the term new media, we vomit. Because it has been this way for many, many, many years. If you want to be old media, by all means, try to submit your assignments non-electronically and see what happens. <laughs> it doesn't happen. So, our anxiety about digital media, not new media, digital media, comes from how the economic model operates and modulates human affairs. So what I'm going to do today is unpack that economic model and how it acts to modulate human affairs. Modulate means control and change. Basically, what we need to understand is that digital media is all about creating a very fine, granular view of each of us individually. The process of doing this is called the creation of a data subject. Every one of us has a shadow self. There is you, and you exist. Okay, this isn't a fucking philosophy lecture. All right, you are real. But there is a second you. A model made entirely of the data accumulated by your use of digital media. It sits on servers, it is operated upon, and it continually happens. And here's the kicker, my friends. Have any of you ever been on Amazon? Have you ever been on Amazon? Everyone's been on And then, when you've left Amazon, you've seen an advert on a different site for something you were looking at on Amazon. Now, that's a very common phenomenon. Have you ever had, though, an advert given to you on a different site about something which is quite similar to what you looked at on Amazon, but not the same? A similar kind of product, maybe by a different producer, Maybe a different product, but it's in the same kind of view. So you've been looking perhaps for a laptop and you said you've got an advert for a headset or something like this. Has this ever happened? Has 
six and not eight bits. Good. And do you think that's creepy? Does it freak you out? Do you think that there's somebody watching? <laughs> that there's some creepy guy in Amazon literally zeroing in on you at that point in time? Well, there is no creepy I mean, I'm sure there's no creepy guys in Amazon. It's got that kind of vibe to it. But, um, but there isn't a creepy guy. Okay? The creepy guy doesn't exist. The creepy guys own the companies. They don't work for them. What's even creepier is this. That that's happening right now. It's happening 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. You have no control over it. The only reason you tap into it at that point in time is that you have visited some digital service which is carrying those patterns. But that analysis of what you are doing, how you are doing it, and why you are doing it is occurring right now, even as this phone sits on the table here. It's analysing why you're not using it. Why does Georgia not use her phone between 9 and 9.50 every Thursday, every Tuesday morning? It's a pattern. And the data analysis looks at patterns. Always. <coughs> this is why companies like Greg's know when you're on campus. I don't think Greg's high-end operation, Greg's, right? Greg's is a high-end operation. If you have an app installed that has Greg's stuff on it, they know when you're around. <clears throat> they know when you're making purchases. So you might think, well, is that useful for a company like Greg's? Sure it is. It really is, because it targets where you are and when you are. This is happening with every organization. Here's the really <coughs> horrible thing. You know when you swipe that in? Swansea University are telling all those companies where you are. Because we sell our data. Yeah. Good money maker for the university this. To have, because, you know these lovely little things? Do you know how they work with that card reader? Anyone know? These are RFID enabled cards. So, <coughs> your location is not just dependent on you swiping the card in. When you're on campus, and indeed when you're on points outside of campus, even if it's in your wallet or purse, the university will know where you are. So it's not like there's some creepy guy in the university, <laughs> and again, there's lots of creepy guys who work for Swansea University. But there's not a creepy guy that's looking, okay? All of this <coughs> is not just used to push products out, but to shape our choices and behaviours in the world. So, I'm going to do a little exercise with you now. I want you to take a second, and what I want you to do is to <coughs> list all the reasons that you are at Swansea University studying a media degree. What you believe are the reasons why you are here. Do that now. Think about why you chose your degree and Certain points in your degree, you're going to be uh, talking about something called the digital revolution. 
was a period in the 1990s where digital technology was supposed to change society for the better. Okay? As digital technology emerged in the 1990s, and in particular as the internet became a primary mode of communication between people, there was supposed to be this utopian sort of revolution that occurred. It's best exemplified by this guy, who's now sadly passed away, called John Perry Barlow. In 1996, he proposed um, a small, very short text <coughs> called A Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, where he proposed that the internet and related technologies to the internet would be able to liberate us from all the control and awfulness of governments and institutions and organizations, which had been a blight on the lives of many, many people in the 20th century. Instead, the internet would provide us with a space where human beings could act in a completely free way. There would be no constraints. Governments couldn't control cyberspace. <coughs> Governments couldn't track us. Governments couldn't make us do things. We could create a space where everyone could actually be free. Unfortunately, it would have been nice if John Perry Parlow was right. Uh, he lived long enough to see how wrong he was, which is even sadder in many ways. And he became a major critic of how digital technology and the internet has developed in the 21st century. But in the 1990s, at least, it seemed like Barlow might be onto something. When the internet first became widely available post-1995, it was like a digital freedom zone. You could do anything. You could sell anything. You could buy anything. You could put anything up. There seemed to be no control whatsoever on what was going on online. That was good and bad in equal measures. I remember the internet in the 90s. There was lots of good stuff. There was also a hell of a lot of stuff that you didn't want to see as well. So it gets it doesn't change that much, really. But Barlow's idea was that we could have a space free of the mechanisms of control that we saw last week, where basically the ownership of the means of production of media and society would not apply to the internet. And therefore, companies that owned major media outlets, companies that controlled the flow of information to the media, they would have no influence over the internet. We would have a free and open media environment at last. And so that ideological control, which was a feature of the political economy of the media of the 21st century, wasn't going to happen in the 21st century. There was no way <coughs> that big media organizations could take over media in the same way that they had in the 20th century. It was going to be different. People were going to be able to express all their opinions. <coughs> Information would be free. Everyone would have the same opportunities. The truth would be out there somewhere, rather than filtered through ideological lenses of the media, which was a result, really, of the political economy of the media in the 20th century. This hasn't happened. Barlow's idea was predicated on a very simple like, a set of premises, the most important being there would be no overall control of information on the internet by any one human company. But what we've seen in the 21st century is that that has happened. In particular, a few major companies have emerged who control the vast amounts of traffic online. And that control of traffic means that they control information and they control how people basically receive things in the digital age. This was not foreseen in the 1990s, but it became something that occurred in the 2000s. <coughs> Before we go any further, who are these companies? Who am I talking about? Give me some names. Google. Google, number one. Google is actually, does anyone know what the actual company name for Google is? Google's parent company is called Alphabet. Alphabet is one of the biggest companies in the history of humankind in terms of its market value. So we've got Alphabet for one. Any others? Meta would be another one. The parent company of 
Facebook, Instagram, etc. Meta, also one of the biggest companies in the history of humankind in terms of its value. Any more? Apple, definitely. Apple providers of major hardware and indeed, most importantly, phone operating systems. <coughs> People often think, well, how is Google really big? Because, uh, you know, just a search engine. It's like 85% of phones on the planet use their operating systems. That's how it's big. Yeah, Apple's another one. There's another major one. We usually talk about the big four. There is another major one. I actually think there's five. The fourth one is Amazon, which doesn't just control online commerce, but it does to an alarming extent, but also Amazon Web Services provide hosting of a huge amount of traffic online. Uh, their server services are the biggest servers in the world. The fifth one would be Microsoft, uh, who still provide operating systems for around about 90 percent of computers and PCs right, across the planet as well. So, those are the five big companies that have really been able to consolidate the digital world in a way that wasn't foreseen in the past. In a way, and it didn't have to be this way either way. Governments could have stepped in and stopped this from happening. They could have said, no, Microsoft can't be the only option for people who do business. There has to be a different way. But they just never did it. <coughs> and so, you know, nobody, there was no reason why everyone had to use Google for search. Governments could have stepped in and said, no, this is creating a monopoly. We don't want this. They just didn't do it. Guess why? Who do you think Google was giving money to to make sure this wasn't happening? Yeah. Google was lobbying and giving money to governments since the early 2000s in order to stop this from happening. So, when we use the term internet, we're referring to a global system of interconnected computers that use internet protocols to communicate. Your phone... Steel George's phone, is an internet-enabled device. It has a series of protocols programmed into it, which allows it to exchange information with local servers in order for you to connect to different services. Anything that does that is an internet-connected device. In this day and age, we have more internet-connected devices, in fact, by a magnitude of about 10, than there are people on the planet. In my house, I have internet-connected computer, internet connected phone obviously, but I also have wonderful devices like my internet connected washing machine. What is the point? Nevertheless, it is wireless and I can, if I want to, set my washing machine using my phone. I have never done this, I don't know why anyone would do this, why is that easier than me going up to it and turning the dial and then letting it go, I don't know. I do also put washing, I think. So very important. Um, what else have I got that's internet connected? My fridge is internet connected. Again, I, it, it, I can program it apparently to tell me that I need to buy eggs. I fucking know if I need to buy eggs because I go on like, oh, do you know what? I really fancy some eggs. And I look, I ain't got any. That's how I know to go and buy eggs. And it's tried and tested system. My speakers are internet connected. Yeah? My doorbell is internet connected. I have a ring doorbell which is primarily useful for seeing the family in the opposite me because they are they have been on the verge of divorce for about 15 months. So it's, a, it's very interesting to see which one is going to storm out today. But every day it's either the wife or the husband. They, those two, they provide me with hours <coughs> on that ring doorbell. I have uh, internet um, lights. So when I'm walking up to the house and it's dark outside, my lights will come on as I go through the gate. Because I have connected them to do this. It's connected to the um, geo sensor in my phone, so the light system knows when I'm near and also can judge what time of day it is. And if it is dark and come near, say I've been down uplands and I'm staggering back in a semi comatose state, the lights will come on for me so I don't break my neck when I try to climb the steps. These are all really, really handy things. Devices connected everywhere. I refuse to get a watch. Absolutely refuse. How many of you have got a smartwatch? 
I, don't, I know it's more than that. I don't know why people are getting reticent about this. It's absolutely fine to own a smartwatch if you have one. I don't want the companies to have, let me not have a smartwatch because that's a level of data I'm not prepared to actually go through when they know how much I sleep, how much deep sleep I get, what my resting heart rate is, what my <coughs> blood pressure is. I'm not prepared to get into that with these companies because then they're starting to market new things about labeling. It's embarrassing, basically, because they're going to start marketing me things like vegetables. And so, you know, you need to bring your heart rate down and your blood pressure down because you're a sick man. You know, live healthy. It's like, oh, can I fucking live? I just have the time. That's why I have the internet. So, on the internet, we have a number of services and software applications. Okay? So, things run on the internet. If we think of the, all of this as an infrastructure, the internet is the road. Software is the vehicle that runs on the road. The internet is like a, a set piece of infrastructure on the ground level, and things run on the internet. Applications you get on your smartphone are on the um, are not the internet themselves, but they are running on the internet. Similarly, the World Wide Web is not the. This is where this is the reason why I do this slide is please don't confuse these terms because I saw it on. If you write an essay, you know, it's like I saw stuff on the internet. No, you didn't. You've never seen the internet. The internet is a bunch of cables that runs under <coughs> the ground. You saw that I have seen something on the World Wide Web, which is an application that runs on the internet. It's very important to get the terminology right. Applications on your phone are not the World Wide Web, but they run on the internet nevertheless. Okay? So, when Barlow, Barlow was talking about freedom of cyberspace, he was discussing the freedom people have to communicate and create on the World Wide Web in particular. Barlow saw the World Wide Web as being a really important platform which should allow us to be free. And ironically, it's those platforms, it's the World Wide Web that has become controlled, but also companies have developed their own platforms to run on the internet, which takes us away from the web and controls what we do. So if you open Instagram on your phone, you are not on the World Wide Web. The Instagram application is a closed application doesn't run on the World Wide Web. What do you think? Well, what's the point of that? Well, it means that it's not connected to anything else. You are only ever working within Instagram's infrastructure at that point in time. That means Instagram can control particular things. In particular, traffic basically going to you as a, you know, as a target for consumers. <coughs> so applications became very, very important in the 2000s as a way of increasing control. Now, we use a particular term to describe the effect of all of this, and it's called digital oil. And digital oil is a very, very important term for you all to understand. The inventor of the World Wide Web, and again, this is one something that really pisses me off, because people will say in the essay, Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet. So, no, he didn't. He did not do that. In fact, there's an argument to be said that Tim Berners-Lee wasn't even alive when the internet was invented. The internet has been around since the 1960s. It was developed by the US government in response to the threat of nuclear war. The first instance of the internet was a system called DARPA-NET, which went live in 1969. Um, basically, the infrastructure of DARPA-NET is the same infrastructure that we use today, it's just much Tim Berners-Lee invented, invented, Tim Berners-Lee created what we call the took a bunch of things which already existed and combined them together in a creative way in 1992 in order to create a protocol system called the World Wide Web, which basically allowed people to exchange text, video, images in single pages for the first time online, to create the idea of a website. That's why it's called a website. So it runs on the World Wide Web. That's clearly the name. So the inventor of the web, Tim Berners-Lee, who is British, claimed that the web itself is under threat from misinformation, questionable practices of political advertising, the loss of control of personal information, and the weaponization of the web by major companies. And it's that word of weaponization which is important. Weaponization refers to the use of data harvested and analyzed by Facebook and others, and then deployed as tools for political gain. For 
Tim Berners-Lee, algorithms trawl through the interactions and activities of users on the platform to gather sensitive personal information about sexual orientation, race, gender, intelligence, <clears throat> and even childhood trauma. If you discuss sensitive issues using something owned by Facebook, it knows. So if you use WhatsApp to talk about something because you think it's safe, it's not. WhatsApp uses end-to-end -end encryption, which means the third-party users can't break in that algorithm. The company that owns WhatsApp can, because it's their system. They know the encryption key. They have all that information. They set it up. So using digital services to share very, very <coughs> personal information, it's not safe to do that. If you don't learn anything else today, that is something you should take away from this. If you've got something really, really personal to tell somebody, the only safe way of doing it is face-to-face, -face using your voice. That's it. And that, not even that's necessarily that's a frightage. Yeah, exactly. So, we call the process of doing that, mining, refining, the digital oil. In 20th century economy, oil was the primary commodity of the world. Oil runs everything. <coughs> Wars are fought over oil. Oil is big business. In the 21st century, digital oil is data. Data about us. Our data is the digital oil. Companies that are good at refining digital oil become huge, like Meta, like Google, <coughs> like Amazon, like Apple, like Microsoft. Those companies that have perfected the art of mining and refining our data, packaging it together and selling it in an effective way to advertisers, they have become the dominant com companies in the 21st century. They dominate everything. And they dominate it on the basis of they are the best at handling Best at getting it, best at using it. The result of this is that you can then target users with tailored information to play on psychological and personal profiles to persuade people to take particular courses of action. What I would missing from that sentence is flaws. One thing that Meta does in particular is harvest information to identify psychological <coughs> flaws in its users and then exploit them in particular ways. Now, people have cited at the bottom there, Carol Kabbala and Emma Graham Harrison. That article <coughs> that I'm citing is actually about uh, the use of data by a company called Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica was a third party company that um, illegally used a huge amount of data, over 50 million accounts worth of data. Facebook users in 2016 in two very key events. In 2016, we had the presidential election in the United States, and we had the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom. Cambridge Analytica were hired by the Vote Leave campaign in the United Kingdom and by the Trump campaign in the United States. And what Cambridge Analytica did was use all this information they had on 50 million people who were not selected at random, but were selected as people who might be able to be persuaded to vote for the other side. Analyze that data in terms of the psychological flaws of each individual in that data set using algorithmic software. So it's not like somebody was working on more than 50 million in the world, because that was a lot of effort. They used algorithms to do this, and then target those people directly with sensitive or with information that appeal to the sensitivities in their psychological profiles. For example, three days before the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom, people who expressed an interest in animal rights were sent information about how the European Union was going to weaken animal protections in the future. Direct advertising information telling them that this would be the policy of the European Union as time went on. 
That's never happened. In fact, the European Union has strengthened the environmental and animal protection over this period of time, since 2016, whereas the United Kingdom actually has weakened those protections during that period, doing exactly the opposite of the adverts say. But it is estimated that there was an extremely successful way of persuading wavering or non voters in the Brexit referendum to back the Vote Leave campaign because they felt it would be good for animals if they voted to leave the European Union. It was a complete lie. As was most of what Cambridge Analytica produced. They did similar things in the United States with the Trump administration, where they targeted voters who may have voted for Hillary Clinton or may not have voted at all. In fact, one of the key things that um, um, Cambridge Analytica did was persuade a lot of people in the United States not to vote. The turnout of the 2016 US presidential election was extremely low, and the people who didn't turn out were people who would traditionally vote for the Democratic Party, whose candidate was Hillary Clinton. Trump and his campaign successfully realized something. You couldn't persuade these people vote for Donald Trump, because Donald Trump is an absolute car crash. But what you can do is persuade them not to vote at all. And if you get enough of them not to vote, then Donald Trump will win by default, because he will win the seats that he needs to, because other people have stayed away. So the most successful thing that was done in the US election was actually to persuade people not to vote at all, to tell them that voting was a waste of time by telling them that Hillary was going to win anyway, so there was no point in going. They targeted specifically African Americans in particular states, like Michigan. The state of Michigan was won by Donald Trump and one of the narrowest margins you can imagine. And it was won fundamentally on one basis, that voters in and around Detroit did not turn up to vote in large numbers. Detroit, major city in the United States, primarily African American population, has always strongly voted for the Democratic Party, no matter who the candidate is. In the 2016 election, a huge targeted campaign went on in the city of Detroit, and people stayed away. Trump managed to cover Michigan and managed to win Michigan, despite the fact that he lost heavily in Detroit because he didn't lose as heavily as he should have in Detroit because lots of people. <coughs> so when you want to think about what is the effect of digital oil, that's the effect. You are able to tap into people's psychological profiles in order to get them to do what they want. As Jan Lanya, who's a great, great digital theorist, argues, what we've seen in the 21st century is that the digital world has become completely consolidated. The dominance of a few companies has afforded them to be the opportunity to become vast data aggregators with the potential to disrupt and be and disrupt society in the wider context and also be disruptive. The whole world <coughs> is now dominated by a few companies. And what I mean by that is that dominance isn't just economic, it's in terms of behaviour as well. Let's take five minutes. Or not. <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs>